Thank you. So I've really had a great day today. Really good talks, some of which I really agreed with, some of which I really disagreed with. For example, wasting time, squandering cognitive resources. I do it all the time. I wouldn't exist if I couldn't squander, if I couldn't waste time. So I love you people who invent little things that cause me to waste time. That's where the best ideas come from. I was also very disturbed about the comment about Isaac Newton, who wasted all his time trying to, what, transform lead into gold. Gee, if he hadn't wasted all that time, maybe he would have become famous. <laughs> because, you know, wasting your time trying to do something that's impossible is how great ideas come about. Because had he succeeded, wow, right? And you never know beforehand which ideas are wasted and which are not. So it's really, impo it's really important to stress that you must try the impossible and you must fail. If you aren't failing, it means you're not trying hard enough. If all you ever do is succeed, it means you aren't taking risks. So good that Isaac Newton wasted so many years. The last talk, Dario, was interesting because he said that designers lie. Well, for years I've been saying that marketing people lie, <laughs> and that's why they're so successful, and we don't lie, and that's why we fail. So if you want to convince the marketing, if you want to convince the product folks to listen to what we're doing, Dario spoke the language. Remember he said we presented all these things, but actually we made a model. We just made the CEO crawl through on his hands and knees through all the paper and all the forms. You have to speak their language, and part of their language is numbers. And where do you get the numbers from? You lie. <laughs> now, MBAs learn how to lie. They go to school for two years learning how to make up those numbers. But we're smart, we can lie without going to school for two years. They have to be plausible, those lies. What I try to do in my life is examine the obvious, question the obvious. If somebody <coughs> believes something too much, it means no one's ever thought about it. And a lot of the things that we take for granted, like speaking of, well, not quite Newton, but almost, you know, a heavy object falls faster than a light object. Obvious, isn't it? Not only is it obvious, but it's true. If I drop a heavy lead ball and a wadded piece of paper, which is very light, the ball will drop faster than the paper. But if you examine that very carefully, you begin to understand maybe why one drops faster than the other, and that, for example, if there were no air, maybe they would drop at the same speed. Examining the obvious gives many new insights, and so that's what I try to do. Design thinking, oh, it's wonderful, but it's a myth. Doesn't exist at all. Design thinking is what all creative people have always done all their lives. Means not answering the question they've given you. So one thing I recommend to you is if you're asked to solve a problem, refuse. That's my first consulting rule. Never solve the problem the client asked me to solve because it's always the wrong problem. So you were asked to draw a vase, remember? And everybody sat down and immediately drew pictures. And then you said, no, no, let's make it a more pleasant way to enjoy flowers. And what did you do? You immediately sat down and drew pictures. I didn't like that. <laughs> Why did you start with the solution within seconds of being given the problem. Uh-uh. When you start immediately with a solution, then you're stuck with that solution. And later on, if you find difficulties in it, you're going to force yourself to save it. So you should never start with the solution. First of all, you should start saying, is that the right question? Why am I being asked this question? What's it about? What do you really want? And second, when you start thinking of solutions, never think of one. Think of three or five, because then, not only does it enrich your set of possibilities, 
but you will avoid the trap of being caught with your favorite solution. Because when you have two or three, then, well, which is the favorite? You might combine them, and you might find a different approach. In fact, I have a friend who feels that when you design, you should always think of a solution, and then think of the anti-solution. Whatever the principles are you use to get to that, reverse them. Again, to avoid being trapped. So one of the things I've looked at, I've looked at a whole bunch of things that are obvious and that sometimes are wrong, is simplicity. Everybody complains that our products are too complex. We gotta make them simpler. And we've heard this for year after year after year, and the, certainly the usability community has argued for a long time about things getting too complex. I argued about featureitis, killing products, making it very difficult to use. But what, you know, we still keep making them, and people still keep buying them, and you folks probably buy them. You go to the store, and you see, well, this one does this, 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 and this one does this, 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 and those two, and you buy the one that does those two. So what's going on here? If actually we know that adding features makes something harder to use, yet we buy it. And here's the difference between the design community, which we represent, and the marketing community. We try to figure out what people's real needs are. They try to figure out what people actually buy. And those aren't the same things. And what they buy is more important than what their needs are from the company's point of view. Because it doesn't matter how great your product if people don't buy it. So let's look at complexity and simplicity. So I'm going to argue that complexity is good and that we should learn to live with complexity. This is the cover of my new book, Living with Complexity. So why in a book about complexity does the cover have a salt and a pepper shaker, which are two really simple objects? One has five holes, one has one hole. Um, okay, which one is the salt? How many of you think the salt is on the left? How many of you think the salt is on the right? For those sitting in the front, about half the audience thought it was on the left, and about half thought it was on the right. And if I ask you to explain your reasons, and by the way, I've asked this question all over the world, and I get the same answers. And you'll say, well, it's salt is on the left because it has more holes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other people will say, pepper is on the left because it has more holes. <laughs> and I say to you, it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what the person who filled it thinks. <laughs> and so even simple things like this can be complicated because you don't control what's going on. So to make something complicated is not a matter of lots of parts and lots of complications, etc. It's do you have any control? Can you understand it? So I want to distinguish between two words, complex, which means lots of things going on at once, and complicated, which means confusing. And there is an important difference, and I argue that a good designer can change complex things into understandable things, but that the complexity is necessary. And why is it necessary? Well, because life is complex, and the tools that we build have to match the life. And what we really want is not simplicity, because people don't buy simple things. We want things we can understand. And that's a design problem. So let me go through a whole bunch of examples of everyday life. Here's something that is complex, but enjoyable. This is a Korean meal. This is not a special meal. This is a typical everyday Korean meal. Or. Um, Railroad tracks, not, you know, it's not every day, everybody's occupation. But you can see that's complex, but you can also see that, you know, if I worked there, I could understand it. It's, I can just look at it and understand it. Or life. That's a city, that's a street scene in Hong Kong, but I could probably take the picture here in Lisbon. I could take it almost any place and show that life just sort of happens. And people build things and do things where there's room to 
where there's an opportunity, and so it ends up being complex, but you come to understand it. Here's something that's really simple, but complicated. So which switch does which? <laughs> and so what you do in these cases is you either turn every single one on and off to figure out what it does, or really, you put them all up and you, or you put them all down. They're too difficult to deal with. Which way is the wind blowing? <laughs> it's a real picture. I did not use Photoshop. Taken out of the window of my apartment in Chicago. That's the way the wind is in Chicago. It's going in all directions at once. Or the dean's office, the dean of engineering at Northwestern University. Uh, very simple, you know, this is my standard trick, which is doors, which defeat me all the time. You go there and you grab the door <coughs> on the right and you pull and nothing happens. So there's an, op oh well, look at the affordance on the left, a flat plate, all you can do is push, great. You push it and nothing happens. <laughs> you have to push the pull handle on the right. And when I showed this to the dean's assistant, she said, oh, no wonder everybody has trouble. <laughs> or even simple things. What could be simpler than a lock? Right? You put a key in and you turn it clockwise or counterclockwise. You could remember that, certainly. No, not when I have 50 keys in my life and every year there's another lock and another lock. Who can remember? So what do we do? The standard way to look for problems, someone had pointed out earlier, look for hacks. A hack is a sure sign that there's a problem and there's a workaround. And one of the standard hacks is signs. So when there's a sign, you know there's a problem. So here somebody has posted an arrow. Or here, this is actually my house. I go around with little dots. This is a big one, but I go around with little and big dots and I put them all over, reminding me which way the switch is supposed to go, or in this case, which way means locked. Or a hospital restroom, um, which way is locked? So a big sign. Or the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, <laughs> which way does the key go? So again, even simple things can be complicated and complex things can be both understandable and fun. So, you know, it's not about whether it's complex, that's the wrong dimension. Now there's some interesting issues about culture. There's a long held belief that Asians really love complex things, whereas Westerners like them simpler. We, the Western ideal is the Bang & Olufsen audio set with you know, sleek panels and hardly any controls. And the, uh, <coughs> the Asian ideal we assume is a street life in Tokyo with blaring lights and neon signs and sound systems, and um, you know, Google is typical of the United States, simple, fair, and elegant, and this is India, and this is uh, Korea, and even the appliances, this is an LG appliance in Korea, um, and it's just got parts and parts and parts and parts, and it's actually, it's interesting if you go to a Korean department store, where their products are made by Siemens and General Electric and LG and Samsung. Um, they all seem, they're all the same as our products, except the Korean ones seem more complex, if you will, or even complicated. And I asked my Korean friends why that is true, and they say, oh, it's a status symbol. If you buy something like this in Korea, it shows that you are sophisticated and have money. <coughs> and the fact that you can't use it is irrelevant. Well, that's not a Korean trait. That's a human trait. In the early days of copying machines, my students went out to study why people were having trouble using copying machines. And they were complex and complicated. But we found that the most complex and complicated ones were often bought by law firms. And they put them in the waiting room. Because they didn't use them. They wanted their clients to be impressed that they had the most modern, latest technology. This is the United States. So 
what is the cultural <laughs> difference? Well, here, that's a complex machine, vacuum cleaner, actually. It must be Asia, right? Well, not really. It's a Dyson machine from Great Britain. Or, um, well, well, that's a complex website. Well, that's Yahoo from America. Or that's my.yahoo. Um, so there's a simple one. Well, oops, that's Baidu. That's Chinese. So is there really a cultural difference? I actually gave a talk in Shanghai recently in which I argued that from the design point of view, there were very few cultural differences. That we like to think that there are big cultural differences, but they more have to do with social interaction than almost anything else. And if our products <coughs> mostly are being used by single people or to do a particular task, then the cultural differences go away. And if you look at modern technology, it's the same all around the world. The cell phone's the same, the automobile is the same, the computer is the same. The task dictates what the device should have and how we should use it. And despite what the theme of human-centered design is, that the technology ought to obey human needs, an argument I've long made, that's not really true. If you actually look at what has happened to human beings, we have adapted to technology. Uh, we sit in these nice orderly rows, even though it may be difficult to see or hear. Um, we make sure there are electric outlets nearby, or we, we maneuver our chairs to be near the electric outlets. Uh, we, in fact, restructure our apartments for electricity and for heat and for plumbing and roads. There's as much area used for parking and for driving almost as there is for living. And technology has dominated and controls the way we live. We adapt ourselves if the activity seems sensible. If that's what we have to do to do it, okay, we'll change ourselves. I mean, one of the most awkward inventions of all times is the violin, which you have to hold in a very, very awkward position, so much so that people actually do injure themselves and are no longer able to apply the, play the violin the way you have to hold the left hand. But it seems sensible. I mean, you know, we have to have strings, we have to have them at different tensions and maybe different lengths or different weights, and we have to be able to <coughs> touch the frets and um, bow, and well, this is the only way to do it. And if it seems sensible, we will adapt to it. So activity-centered design dominates over human-centered design, which it has to, because the problem with human-centered design is we have to study individual humans Yet we want to make a device that's used by millions or tens of millions, or in the case of a cell phone, even a billion people. So what does it mean to study individuals? And what are the cultural differences? The cultural differences are mainly uh, have to do with the way people interact with people. And that will start having a big impact now that we have finally social networks. But as long as they're mainly doing tasks like Google, well, is that so simple? Looks simple. If all you want to do is search, yeah, you just type in, but Google does lots more than search. Google spends billions of dollars, literally, buying up all sorts of other companies. W where do you get to them? Well, if you look at that, first of all, there are 20 places to, kit, to click. It's not quite as simple as you might think. And <coughs> if you look up on top, there are a bunch of menus, and the one on the right is called More, and if you click on that, well, it's got a whole bunch of alternatives, and the one on the bottom is called Even More More. <laughs> so how simple is this simple interface? It's misleading. It's actually, if you want to just search and type something, it's really simple. If you want to do anything else, it's harder to use. Bing, same thing. Looks simple and elegant, but there are 28 places to click, and some of them you can't see. Now that's on purpose. If you actually move the mouse around, that you'll discover hidden spots around the fish in this case that will explain what kind of a fish it is and where the picture was taken and a little bit of other things. So play with it in Bing that there are all sorts of hidden markers about whatever photograph they're displaying, which is part of the theme that we heard today. It's there because it's fun. Is it usable? No. 
Many of you may not even have known that it was there until I told you. But that's part of the fun. Those of you who knew about it said, oh, I have a secret that nobody else knows. So part of our, how we have to design is for the feeling, for the emotion, for the fun, for the feeling of accomplishment. So actually this woman that we heard about who wastes her time playing the easiest, most stupid games because it gives her a sense of accomplishment, I say hurrah. Everybody should have something they are good at. So maybe what I'm really good at is playing these stupid games. So good, yeah, you have something in life to look forward to, more stupid games that you can master. And there's no end to the number of stupid games people will produce. So look again, there's Naver, which is a uh, Korean website versus Google. One is complex and one is simple, but which is really simpler? Well, it depends what you're doing. If you're just searching, then go to Google. But if you really wanna know what's happening today, and want to explore a whole bunch of varieties, then the one on the right is better. Hence um, the Yahoo website, which is still the most popular home page in the United States. It isn't Google, it's Yahoo. Which is interesting, because Yahoo has a search bar on it. And even though it's the most favorite website, when people go on, people are there, and they're reading, and they're doing things, and when they want to search, they switch to Google, which is very interesting. Also, because we tend to build our technologies in isolation, and because of the business model, so that different companies refuse to cooperate with each other, absolutely refuse, we end up with this proliferation, like, and this is a Korean taxi cab, and I was just amazed by the number of different ways we could pay. You can pay with money, uh, you can pay by holding your cell phone over that particular area there, and um, it, your cell phone is charged for the taxi fare, or there's a taxi meter and you can actually pay with money if you want, and um, if you pay with money, well, there's also a credit card reader, and there's a receipt printer, and uh, there's other things too, like a navigation system and all sorts of other stuff, and yet, and these have, they make no sense, the taxi cab ride driver, puts them in the taxi cab wherever there is room. And it works, it works just fine, because in the end you're told how much the, the bill is, and this means any way I want to pay, I can pay. And I don't have to know where all those things are, it's only the taxi cab driver who has to know, but the, he's the person who put them there. So he understands where each of them is and how to use them. So we don't necessarily have to have structure street in London, close to the Royal College of Art. What's fascinating about the street is the complexity of the infrastructure there. So first of all, three different kinds of pavement, so you can feel the difference as you walk, from the sidewalk to the transition of brick, and then finally to the street. Uh, signs, this one says, look right, because we drive on the wrong side of the street in England, and so, Look to the right, don't look to the left. Um, dash lines, and look at the variety of dash lines. I've measured at least four different kinds, fairly widely spaced, and then on the right, thick, closely spaced, double dash lines, and then there's long dashes, kind of in the middle, and different kinds of dash lines, all with different meanings. I don't know what the meanings are, but they're all different for a reason. Um, zigzag lines, not to be confused with dash lines. Um, zebra stripes, I think they're called. And traffic lights to try to tell you what you should do and you cannot do. It's really interesting, the amazing number of signals that we have. And person crossing the street just ignoring all of it. <laughs> <laughs> or more complexity that we hardly ever notice. But this is a intersection in Korea, and every single thing, with one exception, is artificial in this picture. The street is artificial. If you look at the river and across the other side of the river, you can see all the buildings, that's artificial. The river is actually artificial because they dredged out the bed and they put nice stone walls along it, and that's not where the river normally went. 
Um, so it's got dashed lines to tell you where to cross, and it's got um, a curb to distinguish the driving part from the walking part, and it's got a uh, light, and it's got a Korean flag, and it's got solar cells, and it's got signs, and it's got traffic control signals, and it's got even the tree is artificially placed there, then artificially cut to, that, to look that way, and um, wind vane to tell you how fast the wind is going, and even the bird's nest is artificial. <laughs> the bird had to build it, right? So it's really interesting that if you actually look at the infrastructure that makes our lives work, it's amazingly complex. And as I said, there's only one natural thing in this entire picture, and that's the bird. <laughs> not only is complexity necessary, not only can simple things be complex or complicated, and complex things be understandable, but we prefer complexity. There are lots of psychological studies have shown that if I plot people's preference against levels of complexity, um, things that are too simple we find boring and uninteresting, and things that are too complex we find confusing and complicated, and there's an in-between level we like. But what makes the design challenge so difficult is that in-between level varies with your knowledge and experience. So as you become experienced, your level, desired level of complexity goes up. And this is true of almost everything. Your taste in music is simple nursery rhymes to much more complex things as you grow older and more mature and listen to more music. Uh, tastes, you start off with wine, for example, liking simple sweet wines. And as you become used to wine, you like more complex tastes and flavors. And it's true of art, and it's true of basically everything. And example, to somebody who doesn't paint, <coughs> that may look messy, it may look complicated, you may wonder how you ever manage, but to the person who owns this, every single thing there has a reason, a purpose. Uh, there are many, many different brushes, you don't use just one brush, many different tubes of paint, um, cleaning devices. It makes sense to the person who is an expert at this task for music, completely chaotic, confusing, complicated to someone who doesn't understand how to read music, but to an expert musician, no problem. Um, cockpit, this is a Boeing 787, the newest plane. You certainly hope that the pilots don't think it's complicated and confusing. And it's actually one of the better designed interfaces. Uh, aviation uses lots and lots of good principles. It's one of actually the success stories. Um, aviation safety is improved to the point where it's very difficult to study. There aren't enough crashes. We can go for several years without any aviation crashes. And yes, when we get one or two in a year, they can also have many, many hundreds of deaths, but the average is remarkably low. The messy office. To the person who owns the messy office, in this case, this is Al Gore, um, <coughs> everything has a place. And people who have messy offices often can find things faster than people who have orderly, neat offices. Because you know sort of what each pile is about. And in each pile, the most recent stuff is at the top, and the older stuff is at the bottom. And if you're asked to find anything, everything is visible. It follows the principle of visibility. So that <coughs> asked to find something, you search, you look around, oh yeah, it's probably in that pile. You go, it oh, must be about halfway down. You find it. When things are put away in nice, neat file folders, you can't see anything. You have to remember how I filed it, what words I used, where did I stick it in, which particular pile. So. An interesting thing about this conference is um, a lot of the talks actually have themes that are coming together. And so in <coughs> early in this morning, we heard about flow, Csikszentmihalyi's notion of flow, and that's gonna show up again in complexity because flow, as you may remember, is the state that you get into when you're an athlete, say, 
or a worker, or a musician, or a game player, or a reader, or at a movie. When you get so captured in the events and the activities you're doing that the world disappears, you're embedded in the, t in the activity, and you lose track of time. And when it's all over, you shake your head, wow, where did the time go? I don't even know what time it is. Now, <coughs> remember I showed you that there's a desired level of complexity. Well, the middle level is the engaging level. And this is Czech, Czech, Czech sent me high's um, version of it, which says, look, if I look at the difficulty on the vertical axis and, um, and your skill level on the horizontal axis, what I want to be is I want to be at this level which is just slightly above what I'm capable of doing. Because if it's too easy, it's boring, and I can be looking around and doing other things, and therefore I'm not in the flow state. If it's too difficult, I'm frustrated, I can't make any progress. What I want is a state that's exactly the correct amount of challenge. So I can actually manage, but I have to spend sort of every bit of my attentional capacity doing the task. And that is this flow zone. And as my skill increases, I have to increase the complexity of the task to maintain myself in the flow zone. And so this is the concept of flow, which is another argument for complexity being absolutely essential in our lives to, keep, to get us in this maximum state of enjoyment, really. It's the engaging state of doing any activity. Now, back off to the design challenge of complexity. A friend of mine, Larry Chesler, who used to be chief scientist at Apple and was one of the early users, <coughs> early user testing people who helped develop the, first the Lisa computer, then the early Macintosh, uh, to make sure that it actually was usable by people. And his whole philosophy was that we should be able to generate ideas in the morning whip up a prototype in the afternoon, test it in the evening, and then by the next morning, we have the results. We know whether it's good or bad or the right direction or not, and we can start refining it the next day. So his belief was a very, very rapid prototype and test cycle. And that's ex exactly how the early Lisa and then the early Macintosh was developed, by this rapid set of prototype and test, prototype and test. Well, among the arguments he developed in trying to make the Macintosh as easy as possible to use, which is the basic principle that all our computers use today, was that as you made the surface easier, the insides got more complex. And so he decided that this was a law of the conservation of complexity, that the complexity stays the same. The question is, where shall you put it? And all of you who deal with programmers or engineers know that they would love to put it on the, the hands of the people who use it. And you want to make their jobs harder so that it's easier for those who use it. And the way I try to make this <coughs> work is by not trying to convince them they should do it, but challenge them to do it. To say, oh, I guess you're not good enough to make it easy <laughs> for those people. So. Here's a good example, coffee maker. And um, this is a standard old espresso machine. All the complexity is in your face. So you have to learn how to do it. You have to learn how to control the temperature and the pressure of the water and um, which valves to open and shut at just the right times, grind the coffee, pack it in, tamp it to just the right amount, pre-wet it, do all the things required to make a great cup of espresso. Versus this one, which is in my home, this is the Gaja, <coughs> where all I have to do is push the button. I have a choice of three buttons, the ones in the bottom, um, which is the normal espresso, and then a longo, or, and then an americano. And the only difference among those three is how much extra water is added. Um, but so my only decision is which size do I want or how strong do I want my coffee? And it grinds the coffee, moves it into the proper container, tamps it, makes the water the right temperature, the right pressure, preheats the water, 
puts it into the coffee, stops, waits 30 seconds for the water to wet all of the beans, then it puts the right water amount through at the right pressure, makes the coffee, takes the used coffee, dumps it into a container. In fact, you all see this because that's the same machine, the one outside. Psycho, it says. Well, Psycho and Gaja are owned by the same company. And the only difference between this machine and the one I have at home, this is the commercial version. But it's basically identical. There's that, there's that. Um, but where is the complexity here? It's easy for me. The complexity is in two spots. So just look at this one first. It's the insides, which are very complex. It has a motor, it has gears, it has all sorts of levers, it has all sorts of things inside. And actually, I have to pay the price for the simplicity because once a month, we have to take it apart and clean it. Or here, part of the complexity is all the stuff around it um, that is necessary to complete the cup of coffee. So there's partially the law of conservation of complexity, but look at this one. So here, all I have to do is push a button. I have the choice of two buttons again, small or <coughs> medium. Um, and the coffee comes out. And the insides are very simple. So the inside is simple. Cleaning is trivial. And using is simple. So where is the complexity? Complexity is in those cartridges. Because in the Gaja, um, when <coughs> I grind the beans, and a few seconds later, I make the coffee. And it's well known that the coffee loses its flavor as time passes between the grinding of the beans and the making of the coffee. Well, in the case of pods, I may wait months. I may buy the pods and not use them for six months or in a year. And so the, the manufacturing process uh, and the technology involved in doing that is where the complexity is, to make sure those pods still taste very good, regardless of the amount of time. So there are different ways of dividing up the complexity. But in some sense, in a qualitative sense, there's still the conservation of complexity. And part of our goal is to make sure the engineers are the ones who have the complex problem, and the people who use the devices don't. Now, I've been talking about the need for complexity, but we all know there's needless complexity. And for example, the enemy, people who review the products. Because who is a reviewer? The newspapers and magazines and specialty magazines? Well, they're the people who like to think that they are expert in these products. I'm an expert in the cell phone. I'm an expert in cameras. I'm an expert in cars. So I worry about how fast can this car go between from zero to 100. Or um, I worry about <coughs> how many pictures it will take and how many megapixels and how big the detector is. And, and I worry about all these things that the normal person never worries about. But it gives me something to say and something I can criticize in my reviews. But those reviews are very influential. Salespeople. Motorola once made a, a phone. They had done all the right user research. They figured out exactly the features people really wanted and what people really wanted to do with the phone, and they made a phone that matched it. And they didn't sell well, and they discovered the salespeople wouldn't sell it. Because there it is in the store, and the <coughs> person would come in and say, oh, I want this phone. I've read great things about it. And the salesperson would say, but why would you want this phone? Look, for the same price, you could get this phone. And this phone does everything that phone does, but it also does this and this and this and this. And all oh, the people would say, and they would buy the more expensive phone. Because the salespeople, who were well-meaning, just couldn't believe that everybody wasn't like them, who wanted everything possible in the phone. And then there's simple-minded marketing, which is feature comparison with. So for example, here's the reviewers who say, despite some missing features that make it less than ideal, Despite some missing features, it's still an okay thing? Come on. Or basic features include 
a vibrate mode, an alarm clock, a calendar, a task list, a memo pad, a calculator, a world clock, a timer, a currency, a unit converter, a speakerphone, or a stopwatch. You'll also find voice recorder, stereo, Bluetooth, PC, syncing, USB, fast storage, a file manager, GPS with support for AT&T, a navigator, but it doesn't have voice dialing. <laughs> oh, horrible. <laughs> or you take a look at the modern camera. Menus with scroll and lots of controls in addition and controls on the side. And that was a Nikon, but just to prove it isn't just Nikon, this is a Canon, same thing. Or you go to buy an automobile. So I went to Yahoo, which makes a very nice way to compare automobiles, and I put in four roughly comparable automobiles, and it gives me this little list of features. So there's features on the left column, and along the right it tells me um, how each of these four automobiles accommodate those features. So, well, all right, that's kind of nice. That's a nice comparison, uh, except it's bigger than this, so it's got more. Oh, and it has more. <laughs> and more, and more, and more, and more, and more, and more. Is that how you buy a car? That's kind of crazy. You can imagine all the marketing people going crazy, saying, look, they have 362 features. We only have 360. Oh, <laughs> quick. Well, part of the reason that people there for scream and say, why can't things be simple? <clears throat> I've seen this in the David Pogue in the New York Times did this. Um, he screamed out, why can't things be simpler? Why can't they be simple? And then <coughs> he went out and reviewed the simplest cell phones he could find. And he said, it's a wonderful cell phone, but it doesn't have backlight. Or, but it doesn't allow you to. So I love simplicity, but it doesn't do this, 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 and that. And I think part of the argument is you have this wrong notion about simplicity. We think that. Desirability goes up with the number of features. And at some level, that's correct. Each feature is actually often asked for by customers. Um, it's like Microsoft Word, which has a zillion features, somebody, something for everybody. And everybody complains that it makes it confusing. But every one of those was requested by customer groups who need it. And so every single feature is used by somebody in the world. But each person in the world uses just a tiny fraction of the features. So, but it is true that the more features, the, the more power, and therefore what? The more desirability. But we also believe that the more features, the more complexity, the more difficulty, the more complication. So what this argues is that there's this trade-off, which I think is fundamentally wrong. There need not be a trade-off between power and ease of use, and that's where good design comes in. So there are two different kinds of solutions to the problem of too much complexity. And one of them I call natural, and it's the use of signifiers. The other one is artificial, which is what good designers will do. They'll devise structures that make things understandable. So let me introduce the word signifier, because I once introduced the word <coughs> that has caused nothing but trouble. And that's the word affordances. Affordances is remarkably difficult to explain to people. Now, I don't know how many of you actually understand what an affordance is. An affordance is sort of, it's a possibility. It's a relationship. That's the problem. People would like an affordance to be something visible. You know, I pick it up. This is an affordance. No, it isn't. An affordance is a relationship between, in this case, a person and the world. So this thing affords holding, and it affords throwing, and it affords all sorts of objects to me, but not to an ant, and not to an elephant. And so an affordance is a relationship. And whether I know the affordance exists or not doesn't matter. It's there. Designers, though, want to put something there. So with a screen, you want to say, nobody knew where to push, so I put an affordance there. Well, no, 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 you didn't. You put a marker. 
or um, I didn't know how to open the door, so I added it affords me. He said, no, no, it was already there. You made it more visible. So I then tried to talk about visible affordances. But the problem was the designers really did need a term, and there was no word for it. And the best word around was affordance, so the word affordance lost its original meaning. So I'm now trying a new word. Let's see if it works. Signifier. So affordances still exist, and it's still a very important concept. But the way we discover the affordance is by some visible, or I should really say perceptual sign that signifies the action that is to be done. So I want to call those signifiers. And they're not always visible. It can be tactile, it could be auditory, but it's a sign, a signifier. And some of them are natural. They can come naturally. We don't have to place them. So for example, let's look at some social signifiers. I'm rushing to the train in Evanston, Illinois, to go to, the, to Chicago, which is about 30 kilometers away. And the train only comes once an hour. <coughs> and I rush to the station, and did I make it or not? Oh, there are lots of people waiting on the platform. That's a signifier. I didn't miss the train. Or, ugh, I missed the train. Now, it's not 100% accurate. It may be that you know, it's empty because nobody else wanted to take the train at this hour. Or in, a, in the middle of the city, where there are lots of trains going all sorts of directions, there are always people on the, on the platform uh, because they're waiting for their next kind of train. So it's not 100% reliable, but we use sign signifiers of this sort all the time. They don't have to be placed by designers. Um, these are called desire lines. What that is saying is, walk here. Or <coughs> it's also saying, please put a sidewalk here. And that's saying, please put a staircase here. Uh, and actually, this is such an obvious, wonderful play thing to watch that look at that woman. She's put her chair there so she can sit and watch the people <laughs> climbing up. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a signifier. When you're going through a field and you don't know where to walk or through snow or whatever, you look to see where other people have gone. So trails are important signifiers. And this is interesting. This is a technical university in Eindhoven. And you see the sidewalk with the bicyclist. Well, that wasn't the sidewalk to start with. It was a messy trail through the grass. And there, they intelligently said, oh, that is telling us a signal. We should put a sidewalk there. And they did. And unfortunately, I got there after the sidewalk was there. I would love to have a picture before and after. More trails. This is the same sort of thing. So when you buy a book on Amazon, it says, hey, you bought this book. Well, other people who bought this book, and therefore might be like you, bought these other books. And so maybe you'd like it too. Or um, we've heard about Netflix several times today. Now, you know, people who enjoyed this movie also enjoyed these other movies. Or um, <coughs> it's becoming more and more popular in newspapers to say, oh, these are the articles that people emailed to their friends. And so maybe you would like to read these articles. So these are all trails. They're very much like the desire lines, like the lines that people make as they walk across the field. It's sort of saying, lots of people have done this, so you should, maybe you would want to do it too. Um, when you read a book, we put marks in, sometimes like a place marker, but there's also little marks in the book where I've had it open for a long time. And with a reference book, that often tells you the important places to look at, where marks. Or I'm running to, <coughs> you know, I'm teaching a class, and I'm drinking a can of drink, and I'm almost at the classroom. I don't know what to do with it. It's empty. Um, there's no place to throw it. Oh, there's a flat railing. I'll put it there. Well, as soon as I put it there, that's a marker. That's a signifier. Hey, that's the place to throw your garbage. So we all use this. It simplifies our life. It tells us what other people have done. And it's something that we all can benefit from. So that's the social signifiers. Now let's look at good design. So what do you do with the messy office? Well, here's an early solution. We'll make a desk with lots of places. <clears throat> everything in its place and a place for everything. And this is a Wilton Patton cabinet. It was about well, 1874, this particular one. 
And it's a wonderful piece of furniture, but it didn't work. Because once you put everything away, you could never find it again. Because it's all closed and not visible. And so this was a wonderful device, and you can buy them in antique stores for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they don't work as a desk. Um, bad design. Or remote controls. Bad design. Actually, it's not bad design. It's a lack of design. And these, by the way, all were mine at one point and for all the different devices I had. Now, I have managed to figure out how to control my audiovisual set, which is today, in the home, the biggest challenge is the audiovisual center, where we watch our movies or listen to our music, because we buy devices from all different brands, and they're all different, and they're all compatible. Each comes with the remote control, which is invented by some engineer. And the most important part of the remote control is that it should not cost much money. And it's usually done with a matrix. It's usually three or four buttons wide and very long and narrow. And you can you be a bit clever in how you space the buttons. But the real truth is, even though everybody complains about them, <coughs> nobody decides which TV to buy because of the remote. And so all the usability studies in the world are irrelevant because it doesn't impact sales, which is another important lesson. Doesn't matter how bad something is unless it has an impact on sales. So, but here you can aftermarket. This is a really clever device, which I recommend. Um, I have nothing to do with the company. I do not consult for them. Um, it's the Logitech. It's actually a company, a small company called Harmony that started in Canada devising an activity-based remote control. And then Logitech bought them, but they're still in Canada. And so what they did is they said, look, the problem with the universal remote, people try to say, I'll give you one remote that we place those 20. But uh -uh. what they do is they make it be 20 different remotes. You say, oh, you want to do your CD player? Push this button, and now it's a CD controller. You want to make <coughs> watch a DVD? Push this button, and now it's a DVD controller. You want to change the TV set? Push this button, and it's now the TV controller. No. What you want to do is you want to control the activity. So what you do with this thing is you sit down and you go to the computer and you type in the brand and the model number of every piece of equipment you own. And then it chugs away and then it downloads into your device um, this, which says, OK, what do you want to do? You want to watch television? You want to uh, watch a movie? Listen to music, maybe from and here we have to ask from where, from the iPod, or listen to music from a CD, or listen to music from the radio, or play with your Wii. Whatever the activity is, you push the button, and then it automatically turns the right stuff on and off and provides you with just the controls you need. So if I say, watch a movie, this is what shows up. Just the controls I need for watching a movie. And so for the first time, my whole family can actually use the audio video. That's good design. It's modular, and it's activity-specific. By studying what people actually did when they did an activity, they said, well, you know, if I'm watching a movie, I actually have to switch the TV set to the right input. I also want to control the volume, which means I need to control the audio receiver, the, the amplifier. I ob obviously want to be able to turn the movie on or off or pause it sometimes. So I need to be able to control more than one device. So we give it all to you in a convenient way. Google, uh, for that matter, all the search engines do the same thing, that yeah, you can type some words in, but what if you have a very complex search? Well, we can use Boolean <coughs> logic to specify what we want and don't want. But most people can't handle Boolean logic and can't remember it. So we go to advanced search, we get in English a nice spelling, or in whatever language you speak, a nice little thing that says, you know, find the articles of all of the words, or with this exact phrase, or with at least one of these, or that does not have this word in it, et cetera, et cetera, and you type in what you want. And then when it's finished, it gives you the Boolean expression that it's put together. You can ignore it if you wish, but if you're interested in what it's put together, because maybe you want to type it in yourself or modify it, you can learn. So it's a self-learning system. So it's understandable, 
And it also teaches you how it's working. And then you search. So <coughs> that's another way to tame complexity. Another way is to make things understandable, and that's come back to the old-fashioned conceptual model. So, you know, I won't go over this. We all know there's what the designer has in their mind, and it's what the person using it invents to try to understand the system. And the person who invents it has only the system they're using as a clue as to how it might work. But we can put together great conceptual models. And here's a really good example of an excellent conceptual model. And speaking of designers who lie, this is a lie. But it's good. So this is the file system of a computer. And this is from Microsoft, but if you look at the Apple system, it's basically the same. All the file systems use similar things. <coughs> we depict the files and the folders which they're inside of, and then maybe folders can be inside of folders. And on the left, we have the hierarchical structure, and on the right, um, we have the particular files that are being depicted, and each file is actually an image of the first page of the file. Which, so not only do I have the name of the file, but I might recognize by the image which file I'm looking for. This is not the way things are stored in a the computer. There are no folders in a computer. Everything is stored in this hard disk, <coughs> and not even in order. It's just stored wherever there happens to be room. There are lots of pointers so that <coughs> if this followed, if all this material, material doesn't fit in one place, I put as much as can fit, and I find some other space and put the other stuff, and I make a pointer that goes from the end of this stuff to the beginning of that. And then eventually I have a directory that says, oh, if you want to look for something, here's where you should start. And when I delete something. Well, here with this model, when I delete something, I highlight it and I click the delete key or right click something or I drag it to the trash and it disappears from sight. And if I drag a folder away, the folder goes away and the rest closes up just the way your conceptual model should work. I threw it away. It doesn't exist anymore. Now, actually, it does exist. It still exists. We didn't actually eliminate it from the computer. We just took that very first pointer that pointed to the start, and we got rid of that pointer. But all the material is still there, which is why when you lose something, sometimes you can recover it, which is why when you're trying to cover your tracks, when you did something illegal or wrong, um, somebody else can go in and find the material. So the model really isn't accurate, but it's good enough. It handles 99% of the situations, maybe 99.99% of the situations, makes it easy to understand, that's good design. Now, a problem with this is it doesn't work anymore. Because in the early days when this was developed, a computer was relatively small. And so we would have a couple hundred files. And this made it very easy to find things. Today, we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or when we get to the internet, we have billions. And so making it visible of this kind of model doesn't work. And so we need a new model. We don't yet know what it is. It, right now, it's search, and we all know how hard that can be. The next thing to make things simple is to try to think of the entire activity. Most of our efforts have been focused upon the individual device. Here's a device. Let's make it really easy to use whether it's a cell phone or a radio or an automobile or this, that, or the other. <coughs> if you look at the modern automobile, it has many, many things in the front, um, each of which often is studied very carefully and is usable and understandable. But the, if you take the most expensive cars, like the big Mercedes and the big BMWs and the big Audis or the big Lexus, they are just confusing. There's far too much going on. Uh, <coughs> BMW, the modern one, has automatic adaptive cruise control so that you're driving along at constant speed, a car comes in front of you, the car will slow up properly. In fact, it will go all the way down, it will stop. If the car in front of you stops, your car will stop. Uh, it has automatic parallel parking. If you drift out of your lane, it will vibrate and tell you. So it has uh, <coughs> lane keeping control. It has stability control. It has heating and uh, air conditioning control for the passenger and the right, for the driver, for the passengers, the two separate passengers in the rear. It often has separate audio visual, 
audio and visual controls for every one of the passengers, has a navigation system. It goes on and on and on. And even if every single thing is understandable, the totality is overwhelming. And people cannot manage it, especially while driving at high speeds on highways. So the solution is not to design the individual components, but to design the whole system. Let me just take you with a simple example of the iPod. The iPod is great not because of the iPod. You can find other companies that make music players that are actually quite attractive and quite nice and often less expensive and <coughs> more functions, more memory at least. Um, yeah, this is attractive, but that's not what makes it such a great seller. I believe what makes it a great seller is a systems analysis. Nobody else matches the whole system that Apple has put together. So, First of all, <coughs> first of all, when they started, it was illegal to put music into your music player. And so the only people who could do it were techies, people who understood how to get movies, how to compress it, um, how to then share it. Again, this was all illegal in those days. Apple was the first company to manage to get a license so that you could buy individual songs at a sensible price. Then they made a website that was really easy to use. It's actually an SAP database. And anybody who knows SAP knows it's really complicated and difficult and confusing. And Apple's is simple and elegant. And actually, SAP is really annoyed at Apple because SAP wants to brag about this and say, look, it doesn't have to be difficult. It's up to you to make it really easy to use. And Apple won't let SAP tell anybody that it's SAP. Apple wants all the credit, but I know, <coughs> and now you know. So they made a really simple way to find the music, and when you buy it, it's easy to buy, one click, essentially, and then it automatically comes down to your computer. They made, it's a system. Easy to find the music, easy to buy it, easy to get in the computer, easy to plug your iPod into the computer, <coughs> easy to get the music into the iPod, so easy you don't even have to do anything. You just plug it in and it's done. And then easy to select the particular songs that you'd like to listen to. And so the real power is as a system, a total system. Or if you look at the book readers, <coughs> in the early days especially, when there were mainly just two, the two big ones were the Amazon Kindle and the Sony eBook. And that's the Kindle. There were a bunch of small companies, mostly in Europe, that were producing similar devices. They never sold very much. Now, the Amazon <coughs> and the Sony device were almost identical. They looked about the same. They were the same size. They used the very same e-paper technology made by the same company for the display. So there's basically nothing to distinguish them, except with the Sony, you had to figure out how to get the book and get the book into your computer and then transfer the book from the computer into your reading device. With the Kindle, how do you use the computer? Well, you don't. The Kindle is self-contained. You want to buy something, <coughs> you just look it up on the Kindle and you say, yeah, that, and there it is. So in fact, um, I have been in lectures where someone is talking about their new book they've just written, and I say, oh, that sounds good to me, and I take out my Kindle, and while they're talking, I type in the name, and I buy it, and I have the book in my Kindle while they're still talking about it. And that happened to me just a few minutes ago. So I was listening to Ariel, and he talked about this book called, um, what's it called, The, Detec the Detection. I lost the name. The, the Manual of Detection. <coughs> And um, he had told me about it earlier, and as I listened to him, I said, yeah, I'd like that book. And so I took out, I didn't take out my Kindle, I took out my cell phone, the Kindle application, and I typed in the book, and it's here right now. So, and it's a system, so I can read it on this. And then when I get to my hotel room and I want to read it on the big Kindle, it, the Kindle will open up, and it will open up to where I left off here. And I can read it on my PC. I can read it in my Mac. I can read it on any device I own, and it remembers where I left off, and that's system design. And so one way to, com to overcome needless complexity and things that are complicated is to think of the system 
make it activity-based, and make it all come together effortlessly. So coping with complexity, basically, it's all about understanding. Organization and structure, modularization, good conceptual models. And to guide people, use signifiers, use systems thinking. And that is basically the story. Why do we need complexity? Because life is complex and our tools must match life and we really want understanding. We don't want simplicity, we want to understand what we're doing. So it's about design. Thank you. And although nobody is following me, so I don't really have to go in this corner, I'll follow precedent, which is another important usability principle, that even if you invent a better way of doing something, if it goes against everybody's standard, don't do it. You'll just confuse everyone. We're stuck with a QWERTY keyboard in the United States and Azerty and the variations here in Europe because We've learned to cope with that keyboard and don't change it even though there are others that are slightly more efficient. It's as if we said, oh, I have a better way of controlling the automobile. I can put the brake on the right and the clutch on the left and the speed control in the middle. It's, I've been able to show in the laboratory it's better. Don't you dare do it. So follow convention. I'm here, which means I'll answer questions. No, I have to wait till someone gives you a microphone and then you start speaking. Um, my question is um, regarding what you mentioned in the beginning. You mentioned user-centered design and user-centered design. So one that is focused on activities and another focused more on personas. Um, I was wondering if you have any guideline in which situation one is better than the other? Well, actually, I believe <coughs> what I also like to do, I told you I like to examine things that are taken for granted, but I also like to be provocative when I do so. And so you have to be a little bit careful with the statements I make. Human-centered design considered harmful was the article I wrote. Um, and I said, no, we should use activity-centered design instead. And people said, oh, horrible, I've given up on humans, on people. Well, not really, because think about it. What are activities? They're human activities. And how have they evolved? If a human activity was undoable, we wouldn't be doing it. We would be modifying it. So I consider that activity-centered design is a different viewpoint on human-centered design. And that um, I think the activity dominates. But if you're really doing something that's very new, that people have not done before, then you have a chance to shape the activity. And here's, so when you study activities, you're gonna study people, and you study what people do. But again, I think it's not looking at what people say they do or say they want, but rather what is most effective for the activity and what feels natural. Again, people will learn, you will all learn to do things if it feels like it's appropriate for the activity. But that's a human-centered question. What does it feel is appropriate? And I'd like to remind you, to learn to use a pencil took you a year. Learn to use silverware. If you're in Asia and you use chopsticks, there are some adults who still can't master it. Chopsticks takes a long time, and actually if you go look to Asia, you discover they have baby training chopsticks, and they <coughs> chopsticks joined at the top or with rubber bands and various devices. It's a whole industry making chopsticks easy to use for children or Americans. <laughs> and um, learning to drive a car, you had to take a class, you had to study, and for the first year, you weren't any good at it. Yet when we buy a new technology and it takes 15 minutes of study, we say, oh, that's too messy. I don't want to do it. So um, I believe in activity-centered design, but I actually, in my book, I argue two different people have to work at it. One is the designer to make it understandable, but the other is you. 
The people who use the technology have to spend some time to master it. You're very quiet. I wasn't provocative enough. Uh, yeah, Don, I had a question about uh, sign versus uh, what's it called versus signifiers versus affordances. I'm, I'm kind of confused. Um, to me, it's really uh, yeah, like a gray area between a sign and a signifier. So, can no, no, <coughs> a signifier is a kind of sign. So the difference is signifier versus affordance, not versus sign. I thought because you said sign is an indication of a problem. That's why I was confused. Okay, there are two kinds of language being used here. <laughs> there's the technical language of semiotics, and there's the everyday language. <coughs> so when I said, when I see a sign posted on something with a uh, note or something, that's a sign of a problem, and that's the everyday usage. If I now move into the language of semiotics, there's a whole bunch of terms like signs, and, and signifier is actually um, taken from that field. So don't, those are different words. I'll just carry on from that and be a little bit of a, a stir. I was just going to ask, obviously, phenomenology and a lot of the hardcore HCI people have been a bit upset about affordance. Do you think you're going to be okay with using signifier if it catches on with the semiotics people? Well, first of all, <coughs> the semiotic people can't agree. They use, they use the same <laughs> words that mean different things in uh, different groups of them. And second of all, I could never really understand the semiotic literature. When I read it, it's... I'm just not smart enough to understand it. And uh, third of all, my experience is, is that as soon as any term gets popular, it gets distorted. So usability, ergonomics now is the selling point by people who have no m understanding of what the term means. Um, usability, the same thing. Um, I'm responsible for inventing the term user experience which is now, I apologize to the organizers of this conference, but has become a meaningless phrase because everyone uses it and talks about it. And so I'm, and affordance has become abused. I didn't invent the term, the psychologist Gibson did, but I applied it to the design world. And um, both Gibson and I are turning over in our graves. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and I'm not even dead yet. <laughs> and so I'm sure that signifiers will but maybe it has five years of life. <laughs> and then I can write another book and then another. Someone's supposed to argue with me. I actually like to say this. If you agree with me, that's kind of nice, but I don't learn anything. If you disagree with me, that's where it's fun and that's where I learn. Thank you. In your opinion, is there any relation between uh, complexity and flow? Well, it's yes. The question is, is there a relationship between complexity and flow? And I argue that actually you want the right level of complexity. Now, <coughs> the proper word is not so much complexity as challenge. That often translates into complexity, and to simplify life here, I translate it into complexity. It's really challenge. And so, I mean, if I'm playing tennis, um, and I get better and better, I want to play against better and better comp opponents. Now, does that, is the game getting more complex? To some extent it is, because with a better opponent, the, the opponent is thinking several moves ahead and moving me around, but, you know, it's basically it's the same game. So challenge is the better term. And Czech sent me high, I actually used the word challenge, not complexity. Thank you very much. <laughs>